My name is Ron Van Beek and I'm the National Chaplain for the 5th Infantry Division. My story begins when I was 18 years old and I'm milking cows in Iowa and I get a strange letter in the mailbox from Uncle Sam wanting me to go to Vietnam and to shoot communists. I couldn't have found Vietnam on a globe with both hands at that time. It was an unknown place to me, but very shortly I found myself there and my story begins then as I land in Vietnam at Benoit. There is all the assembly of the men gathered together being assigned to the various units in Vietnam and it was said then amongst us who are conferring together with the veterans of that time, where's the best place to go in Vietnam? And they said, well, the best place to go is the further south you are, the better. The further north you go, the worse it is. More veterans are killed in the north than in the south by far. Well, my orders came down and I was going north. Not only going north, but I was going north as far as you could go north, all the way to the DMZ, across the DMZ, two miles away. We could see the giant red flag of North Vietnam waving at the border of communist North Vietnam and there <clears throat> Underneath of that flag was their outpost guarding North Vietnam with 5,000 soldiers. Now I was flying north on the airplane assigned to the 5th Infantry Division and I knew how bad things were going to get when the plane landed and uh, the person on the plane, all of them took out their pistols, cocked it, and were ready. The plane landed and at the end of the runway is soldiers guarding C2, one of the northernmost bases in Vietnam. Very shortly we were assigned to a company, it was supposed to be C Company, then suddenly D Company had gotten into a firefight and they were running out of ammo and running out of soldiers and they needed replacements immediately. So in a few minutes I'm loaded on a helicopter and I'm zooming across the border, across the jungle of Vietnam at 100 miles an hour. I'm still trying to jam bullets into my magazines because we had to still fill them. Very shortly we see a smoke in the distance and uh, that smoke is where the firefight was. Smoke was billowing out of uh, the uh, out of that beautiful green jungle, black ugly smoke. The firefight that was going on there was even more ugly because if you're flying in a helicopter uh, then you know that the tin of a helicopter side is the same defensive measure as a pop can. A bullet goes through and doesn't stop. There's nothing you can do as the bullet travels through because the enemy didn't want more ammunition to come. The enemy didn't want more soldiers to come. But finally we land and the captain has us get off of the helicopter and they throw on the dead and they throw on the wounded over top of the dead and the captain has us crawling out to where we are shooting at the enemy. And if you've ever been in that situation where you are shooting at human beings, then I pray that you actually never, never, never have to experience shooting at human beings or shooting them shooting at you. It's kill or be killed. 
But eventually that battle ended. I still was not wounded. But now it's nighttime and I'm describing just my first day, my first night in Vietnam. We had dug our foxholes in a circle called a perimeter and it began to rain very shortly. And in Vietnam, it doesn't rain for one hour, doesn't rain for one day, doesn't rain for one week. It rains for months. So here we are, we're on guard. There are 5,000 enemy soldiers within two miles of us that want us dead. So us in our 100 man company have to be on alert. Every two hours you have guard duty and you sleep for two hours. Well, needless to say, I didn't sleep much that night because the foxhole was full of rain. Uh, the mud was sticky and unspeakable. Uh, the, the thin blanket to call the camel that we had didn't keep out any rain. Between the rainstorms, the mosquitoes were unbelievable. There was always five to ten mosquitoes on you at any one given day. But as I was guarding, I'm looking out and I can see a total of three feet in front of me into the total blackness. You haven't seen dark until you've seen Vietnam dark. Knowing the enemy was there, we see all kinds of shadows and uh, those shadows then could be an enemy or they could be an animal creeping up on you or something disastrous like a tiger. For example, four of our men in Vietnam were killed by tigers. Not a very well known fact, but that was a very real, real fact. But this is my first night in Vietnam, two hours on, two hours off. I can't get to sleep after that. my two hours on. I can't get to sleep, obviously, after I'm on guard, imagining every shadow that I shot full of holes was either the enemy or it was an animal. Either way, I really didn't want to meet him. Eventually, the morning comes. And you have to realize, again, dark is dark in Vietnam. The morning in Vietnam is even more striking because the, everybody assumes the morning sun arises, but there's a hundred shades of gray before you get a sunrise. And more and more you can see uh, some of the dimensions and some of the features near you. And you can see then that that bush, that you thought was the enemy that you shot full of holes was really, really a bush. Morning comes, finally the sun bursts over the sky, over the horizon, and we have a quick breakfast out of our sea rations, and that's a total of um, probably about a thousand calories, but just basic ingredients and very soon the captain is saying up oh, we have to march on saddle up move out and i said i pleaded with these guys i said hey what are we doing here we're getting killed real american soldiers are getting killed i'm shooting at real enemy soldiers they're getting killed this is no game. This is war. Can't we talk with them? Can't we reason with them and tell them to go back across their border? Needless to say, they all laughed at me and said, saddle up, rookie soldier. There's 364 more days ahead of you. We're ready for uh, the next battle. Going through the jungle is... A terrible experience. Uh, you can't see more than three feet ahead of you at any one time. And I can't tell you all the stories of Vietnam. I will just tell you a few of them. One day we were walking on a, in a line 
and I was seventh in the line, and we could smell the enemy. They were so close. They eat uh, this special kind of sauce food, and uh, that often permeates the surrounding area. Suddenly, machine gun fire burst out, and the four immediately in the front were killed immediately. The fifth was wounded badly. Uh, the sixth was wounded. The seventh was me. I was not wounded. <clears throat> now, before I go into the battles that were to come next, 365 days, the Lord of heaven and of earth has spared me, and he has been as a wall round about me, protecting me from all the bullets that were intended for me. He absorbed them himself. And then I must backtrack further and say before I left to go to Vietnam, in a moment of great distress, then the Lord spoke to me out of Psalm 118, verse 17, Thou shalt not die, but live, <clears throat> and declare the works of God. And he then stood before me each of the 365 days I was in combat as that wall round about me. And when the bullets flew the thickest, and then he was there round about me. And when the battle was finished, I would have to feel myself. And no, I didn't get wounded. Many of my soldier friends and comrades did. Many were killed, but the Lord was true to his word. I can't tell you all 365 stories. I'll just tell you a few of them that are highlights. The date was November 13, 1969. I'm with my 300 men on Hill 162, which is two miles south of the DMZ. Our 300 men are camped for the night on the top of that hill, dug in deep. Their 5,000 came across the border that night to wipe out our 300 in a human wave attack. They hit us at two o'clock. My three o'clock, we are in deep, deep trouble with our 300 men. The human wave attack has penetrated into our perimeter twice. We had to beat them back hand to hand. Our captain, most of our officers were killed early in the battle. And now, now we are running out of bullets. Over a million bullets would be shot that night. And the noise was deafening. It would break your eardrums. And the Lord spoke to me, Thou shalt not die, but live. But the enemy came against me, and his ugly face of death filled my soul's eye. And he said, The Lord of heaven and of earth has spared you for nine months, but now I have you. How will you escape this certain death? But suddenly the evil one had to flee away out of my soul's eye, and I saw my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in my soul's eye, standing before me in all of his beauty, in all of his majesty, in all of his glory, in all of his power. And he said to me again, Thou shalt not die, but live out of Psalm 118, verse 17. And before I could say, how, Lord, how will I survive this? We had lost over 50 men by this time, and everything was hopeless. We had no more than one minute to live. But suddenly the Lord went to work and that battlefield that was breaking your eardrums for the noise 
of a million bullets being shot, went quiet, quiet that you could have heard a pin drop. For the Lord made a mighty, mighty light shine in the sky, brighter than the sun that lit the battlefield up like as if it was daylight, brighter than daylight. Everyone's position was revealed and everybody more importantly, this is three o'clock in the morning, looking up at this bright, bright, bright light. Their night vision was shot, trying to figure out how it could become sunrise at three o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> but now comes a mighty red curtain from the sky above us, from a mile up, a mighty red curtain that beat back this human wave attack that was so ready to consume us. And then came a mighty roar like 10,000 chainsaws. And I still love loud chainsaws to this day because of the memory of what that red curtain did for us. I'll show you a picture of it. This was Puff the Magic Dragon up here at the top, a mile high, <clears throat> flying in a mile circuit on its side. Puff has its machine guns loaded out of uh, the one side. So as it flies on its side above us, it's aiming its machine gun fire down here to us. Here at the bottom are 300 men desperately fighting for their lives, November 13, 1969. Now each of those red dots that you see on this picture is a flare. In between each flare are five real metal bullets. It can give you some idea of the magnitude and the number of bullets that were shot that night from Puff the Magic Dragon. But I'm laying here at the bottom in side of this cone of safety and I said, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For Psalm 118, verse 17, everything was perfect, just like you are perfect. The right men, the right time, the right everything. Someday when I get back to America, I'm going to look those men up, those eight men on that C-47, and thank them for the accurate shooting that you sent them to save my life, my 300 men's life, and most importantly, to keep the promise that thou hast made from Scripture, Scripture which cannot fail. <clears throat> but when I came back from Vietnam, the 5th Infantry Division had lost 514 men killed and nearly 4,000 wounded. And when I came back from Vietnam, I really, really wanted to just forget about war. And I tried for, for 45 years to forget. Never succeeding until seven years ago I got this picture here. I'm driving in western South Dakota on a routine business trip and I see a sign out of the corner of my eye that says Vietnam Aircraft Museum ahead. And I, God reminded me of my promise that I had made 45 years earlier and I said, 
I'll go into the museum. It's a Vietnam aircraft museum for crying out loud. It will certainly have the C-47 Puff the Magic Dragon there. And I'll go kiss its tire or something. The men won't be there, but I'll kiss its tire in appreciation. But as I come up, come up to Puff to kiss its tire. Here's a man sitting with a Vietnam hat on. I said, what did you do in Vietnam? He said, I was the gunner on this Puff and he gave me a, this picture which I cherish to this day. He said, I was above you that night 45 years earlier. I wasn't supposed to be on that mission, but God put me on that mission and f three puffs were used that night and this picture comes from the second puff that was 10 miles away from uh, their windshield. He gave me this picture uh, which I cherish. But <clears throat> as I said I forgot tried to forget for 45 years. But now I said to Bob Schilling, and that was his name, he happened to be there that day. I want you to come to our reunion and tell the 5th Infantry Division about your mission and what you have done to save the 5th Infantry Division's life in that incredible day. He willingly agreed to. And at our reunion that we have each year for the 5th Infantry Division, he told us a story. <clears throat> he said, I wasn't supposed to be on that mission. I was supposed to be on a previous mission. The previous mission was my, my role, my orders. But suddenly an, a order came down saying that my wife and my two children were in Hawaii and I had a one week r, &R that I could take if I took it immediately. He said, I told my men, I promised I would be on this mission I'll go. They said, no. And no, Bob, you're not going. You're going to go see your wife in Hawaii and to see your two children. He said, I reluctantly went. My plane landed in Hawaii about the same time as my team that I was supposed to be on landed. But they landed upside down they were shot down. They flew into a mountain and all eight of the men perished. He said, that was my mission. God saved me so that he could save you. He told me of another mission too, and that was on the C-47. They have incredible flares. These flares are magnesium flares with intense, intense light as they were flying over another site, and this was uh, now about a month earlier, and then s strangely a Vietnamese, a Viet Cong mortar miraculously hit the tip of uh, the C-47 just as what they are ready to begin firing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that mortar hitting the tip of the C-47, tipped the C-47 up onto its back just as they were ready to throw the flare out. A flare has to be thrown out. It's activated and then thrown out and it begins its magnesium fire seven seconds later. But in that flip over and then that magnesium flare came back into the airplane and was live inside amongst all of that ammunition. And this other 
soldier with Bob Schilling was scrambling around. He was wounded 17 times by the mortar. He's scrambling around inside of the plane trying to find that live fuse because if it goes off, it will certainly kill everyone in the plane and explode all of the information, all the ammunition. He finds that flare and pushes it out the door just before the flare explodes. It burns the side of uh, the C-47, but it doesn't down it. Every one of them are wounded on uh, Puff the Magic Dragon. This man, I forget his name, but you can look it up on the Air Force uh, Monument in Washington, D.C. This man are in the Medal of Honor for his work on uh, that incredible day, saving his whole crew of eight. But to return now to my battlefield, to me, then I want to tell you another story. We had a captain, Captain Blunt, who was one of the bravest men I had ever seen in Vietnam. When the bullets were flying in battle, he was calm as if he was sitting in his desk and he would be mingling amongst us and saying, no, shoot a little more to the right. You're aiming a little low, aim over there mingling amongst us as if he wasn't exposed to all kinds of enemy fire. But now one day we are in an encampment in a valley, a very beautiful valley. We haven't seen any of the enemy for several days. We're dug in deep in that valley and we have a little respite a little vacation time almost in the middle of a war zone. That valley was so beautiful. And that morning they had flown in by helicopter a load of peaches, which is the, the prized ingredient of an infantryman of a grunt. It's a half of cup of peaches that was the best food the U.S. Army provided to us. And we were all going to celebrate at noon that we could eat our peaches together. We're all napping. <clears throat> Everything is peaceful. Suddenly our captain went nuts, went crazy. And I felt a sharp pain in my backside. And when I woke to look what could be causing that great pain, I saw it was my captain's boot, waking me up, waking everybody up, and he is shouting at the top of his voice, run, run, run toward that mountain. Leave everything behind, just run, run, run. Now all of us are in shock. we most of us been napping, but we all knew if our captain was afraid of something, there was something very, very, very dangerous, and we better be running. But lots wanted to still grab their peaches, and they said, can't this wait for a, an hour while we eat our peaches at least? He said, run, and he's kicking and shoving and beating soldiers with his fists to run faster. Now our hundred men are running toward that mountain. We're running as fast as we can. Many are falling, hitting trees. He's picking us up and shoving. And behind him, we can hear him constantly shouting, faster, faster, faster. Finally, we reach to the top of that mountain. And at the top of that mountain, there had been a battle some months earlier, a battle that had left huge holes in the ground. And he put us down into each one of those holes. And just as we're down, he looks at his watch and he says, get down, get down, men, here they come. 
and suddenly that whole valley where we had been in blew up into the sky. A half a million pounds of B-52 bombs on an errant strike hit the exact place where our hundred men had been about six minutes earlier. Now, if you've ever been in a B-52 strike, if you've ever been close, that's not something you want to do twice. The whole sky gets cloudy and dark. Fully grown trees go flying through the air like toothpicks. The fires blaze for a half a mile on each sign and everything within that cone of B-52 fire simply explodes up into the air thousands of feet. Now, for some reason, someone had double-checked their map. And remember, every B-52 flight was top secret. It couldn't be even talked about. But someone at God's instigation has rechecked the map one more time and said, oh no, there's a hundred men right exactly where that B-52 strike is supposed to dump 500,000 pounds of dynamite. And they radioed to Captain Blunt and said, get your men out of there, get them out of there as fast as you can, fast as you can. That was the reason our captain was afraid for the only time I seen him afraid in his life. And he shepherded us up that mountain and he placed us into the safety of the wounds of the battle that had taken place a little earlier in that battle. <clears throat> now he says to all those men, he said, you want to go back for your peaches? He said, you can go back and wait for them to come back down. Aren't you glad you ran? And how glad we were. We could have kissed our captain's feet. The best captain in all of Vietnam. But to continue with that story, then, I use the analogy as a chaplain of the 5th Infantry Division to point out of a greater salvation. Our captain saved us that day. Miraculously, God saved us out of Psalm 118, verse 17, by inclining those B-52 mappers to check one more time whether the flight was clear of men. But in those wounds of the mountain, we were safe as all kinds of debris fell down upon us. 500,000 pounds of dynamite makes an awful, awful, awful big bang. But we were safe. We were safe because we were hidden in the wounds of that mountain. But I apply that to a greater salvation of Jesus Christ, who is the mountain of salvation. And I point out that just as our captain placed us in the holes of the wounds of the mountain, so the Lord Jesus Christ places all of his children in the wounds of his hands and of his feet and of his back and of his head. In Jesus Christ wounds, all Christians are safe. All Christians may trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now to return to my battlefield for another story. And then we have... <clears throat> We were OPCON, which means we were a platoon that is held in reserve in case one of our group gets into a battle. 
the helicopter is ready to fly us into the battle as reserves to reinforce our men. Suddenly, the call comes alert. One of our helicopters had been shot down, inserting our men into battle, and we had to go and rescue these soldiers. Eight men were on that helicopter. Our platoon got onto this helicopter as fast as we could, and we flew north. Remember, we're already north as far as you could go north, and we're flying north. After about 20 minutes, we can see the helicopter. Smoke is rising from the hillside where it had crashed into. An enemy B-52 had shot off the chopper, the helicopter blade, and it crashed into the side of that mountain. And to see that helicopter, then it was smashed, smashed so terribly. But we established a perimeter on the top of that hill right above it. And I have to backtrack for one minute to tell how we landed. The, the pilot of the helicopter didn't want to land on that top of that mountain because it was tall elfin grass and he claimed he couldn't see, couldn't see the ground. So we're still 20 to 30 feet off the ground and he said, get off, get off, get off. I'm not going any lower. Well, we jumped, many ankles were sprained, jumping 20 feet with a full load of, of ammunition in our backpacks was the craziest thing to do. But now we're down on the ground with our 30 men. And I said to the, the LT who was elsewhere, we've got to establish a perimeter here. We've got to get ready. Whoever shot that helicopter down is also near to us. And we got to get prepared. What we really, really need is artillery, an arc of artillery around us. I said to the LT, get a hold of headquarters and tell them we need artillery and we need it now. LT comes back and he said, <clears throat> headquarters says they don't know where we are. They don't see us on their map. Then I knew we were in the DMZ. We were in a no shoot zone where the enemy could fire all they wanted, but our U.S. armed forces could not shoot even an artillery round to support us. That's when I figured we were dead men unless we moved fast, because whoever shot that helicopter down was coming back. We dug down as fast as we could, and I ventured out to this helicopter about a hundred yards down the hill, and we started ripping off the sheets of metal of that helicopter, because there was no door that was open that could be opened. And we drug out seven of those men were on that helicopter were dead. The eighth was badly, badly wounded. And we tried to, as quickly as possible, carry those eight dead men up to our perimeter in the hill, 100 yards higher, and the live man to try to get him to a medvac as quickly as possible. But he also would die in the hospital. Eight men on that helicopter being inserted into a very dangerous battlefield that a lucky shot into their rotor brought them down. Now to show you how difficult and different Vietnam was and how that God's providence works in miraculous ways, my friend 
who had gone into the Rangers was to be on that flight. His name was Jim. And I met him a little later and was telling him about the helicopter crash. And he said, he said, you know, Ron, I was supposed to be on that helicopter. And all of a sudden, I got sick as a dog. He said, and somebody else took my place and I'm alive. My comrades dead. God's providence works in miraculous ways. Some live, some die, but everything is directed by God. But now we are sitting with that helicopter. They flew in dynamite and we blew up that helicopter because we didn't want anything from that helicopter to be retrieved by the enemy because they used everything we had back against us. We blew up the helicopter and scampered back up to the top of the hill. The helicopter that had brought us there this time landed and picked us 30 men up. And as we're flying out, the enemy appears in the ridge line below and we're starting to get RPG fire. We escaped there within a minute of our lives. Again, God performed a miracle out of Psalm 118, verse 17. Thou shalt not die, but live. Spare not only me, but my 30 men that terrible, terrible day. <clears throat> now another story that happened five days before I was to return out of the field. I had spent 360 days in combat and I was so beat, so shattered, so tired. My hand had jungle rot. I couldn't even get my finger who was so swollen. I couldn't even get it into my trigger guard if we had run into battle. And I prayed to the Lord Oh Lord, make the last five days that I don't have to shoot my rifle one more time, shoot one more enemy. But now came suddenly an order. They had discovered a Viet Cong battalion who was in one of the valleys near us with a whole battalion of over a thousand of their soldiers and there was a hospital in there, a Chu Hoi, one who had Chu Hoi'd from uh, the Viet Cong and came to our side, had secretly informed our side that here was where the enemy was hidden. <clears throat> Now to make sure that we went into there safely, the army in all of its wisdom launched a B-52 strike into that valley. All of us are on 17 helicopters ready to insert in the val into that valley as soon as the last B-52 bomb lands and explodes. I'm looking behind me, yes, I'm on the first helicopter, I'm on the lead, I have five days left. We're loaded down with double animal. We have double everything because fighting a battalion of soldiers, there were only eight men on each helicopter the lead was going to get hit the hardest. I'm looking behind me, 17 helicopters with eight men ready to insert immediately after my helicopter. We land right after the B-52 strike and we had, of course, ringside seats to see the devastation that that B-52 strike did. Again, six cells with 500,000 pounds of dynamite. Again, fire 
blazes up to the sky, fully grown trees fly like toothpicks, the whole sky becomes dark, and as our helicopter flies in, it is flying into, like, into a furnace. The flames are leaping high. My helicopter lands. I'm off. I'm in position, rushing into the jungle. We're ready to fight. The other helicopters are all behind us. As soon we have 64 men following me. We get into that blast zone, everything is on fire, but there's nobody there. The night before, God had made it that the enemy had heard that we were going to come. Uh, that happened often in Vietnam. The Russians and through their spy network and through the Walker brothers who were spies within our Navy intelligence. They were informing the Russians who informed the NVA two hours before bomb strikes would hit. We were shocked to find no one there. But certainly there was no one happier than us that there was no one there. But that was the only reason there was no one there. But so now we are, now we are getting back on our helicopters again and flying back to our staging area for a new mission. <clears throat> This new mission is on Mudder's Ridge. God had made it that I had not had to shoot my weapon for five more days until I left Vietnam. So this mission is a backtrack now to another day. We had been out in the field for 70 straight days without a bath, without brushing our teeth, without shaving, without anything but eating out of sea rations, living in the jungle. We were beat. We were so much like animals by this time. And I never can forget that day uh, that the resupply helicopter landed with more ammo, with more uh, sea rations. Out of that helicopter stepped a young man of 18 years old. His, his name uh, then, and he was from Michigan up here. His name was Michael McQueer. Michael McQueer, strange name, but here's this beautiful, handsome young man just out of the States. He still shaved, he still got his hair combed, he still got a fresh uniform on, there's not a bit of mud on him. And I said, I said to myself, oh, you poor, poor guy. You just landed in Vietnam for your first day in Vietnam. You just landed in the worst possible area, just as a major battle is forming up. You couldn't have chosen a worse time, a worse situation. He had to look at us and he had to see a hundred people who looked more like animals. And then people, we were so grubby, so beaten, so muddy. But he willingly joined us and we traveled that day to another hill. We're on the perimeter and we dig our foxholes again, which we do each time. And 
we said, well, Michael McQueer, we better put him in the place that is the safest place. This is his first night. And every time that a soldier is coming into Vietnam for his first night, they see the enemy everywhere. He's scared stiff. So we put him on the perimeter in the place that was the least likely that the enemy would come up. But we're camped now that night and here about midnight comes Michael McQueer crawling up to us in the center of that perimeter and he says in a whisper, I got movement in front of me. I hear something in front of me. <clears throat> and we looked at each other and smiled. And we said, oh boy, you know, here's another first time soldier's first, first night. First night in battle, of course he sees something. We said, go back, Michael, go back and listen closely and come back if you hear anything more. 15 minutes he's crawling back to us again and he said, I tell you there's someone coming, there's someone coming. And our lieutenant says, I'll go and listen, I'll go and see. Now we had just acquired a starlight scope, which was a major improvement for detecting the enemy in the dark. Remember it is pitch dark. He says, I'll grab the starlight and with that starlight, you can see shadows in pitch dark. He lights or he goes down with Michael McQueer, lifts the starlight scope up to his eyes and we only hear one word, fire, fire, fire. And we all fired out at the enemy, which was closing in on us. And we shot six or seven of them from here to the wall, 12 feet away, that had snuck up upon us in the least accessible way, in the least accessible area. Didn't know that they would have one soldier who was very, very alert that night because their mission in each of these tactically was to penetrate into one spot in the perimeter. It's called the fire, the apple blossom theory, and that they focus all of their energy on one spot, all of their men. And once inside of the perimeter, they can work toward the back of all of the soldiers that are there. Michael McQueer had saved us that night, his first night in Vietnam, simply by being so alert. But Michael McQueer was dead. Michael McQueer gave his life. He'd only been a few, few days in Vietnam. Now, when I came back from Vietnam a few years ago as chaplain, I went to Michael McQueer's gravesite about a hundred miles north of Grand Rapids. And I contacted the, the army or, or the VA there and said, you don't happen to know of someone who was named McQueer up in your area that I can visit with the family. And I happened again, by God's providence, the man said, well, yes, I know a McQueer. He's a neighbor of mine. I know him. I said, oh, could you contact him? Could you ask him if I could come up and if I could pray with him and tell him 
how Michael McQueer died. And they said, well, yes, uh, this is pretty unusual, but yes, you can come. So I went up to Michael McQueer's brother, who lived in a house there, and he was very skeptical of whether I was real or whether I was somebody trying to scam him. But when I told him that I had met Michael coming off the helicopter, so bright, so perfect, so clean, I said, and he was dead shortly thereafter. He only asked one question and he said, he said, was it quick? I said, yes, it was quick, was instantaneous, and he was killed. But then we went to his gravesite and we prayed there and I gave him a flag to remember his brother with. Now we just had a reunion down in San Antonio a few weeks ago and we rededicated another flag to Michael McQueer, which I hope in the next few weeks to bring to his brother. And we will have a ceremony at his gravesite to remember, to remember Michael McQueer and his bravery. Most people don't know this about Vietnam. Over 1,500 soldiers were killed on their first day in Vietnam. 1,500 killed. But most people don't also know that 1,000 soldiers were killed on their last day in Vietnam. Vietnam was a very, very, very dangerous place to be. As I said, 514 of the 5th Infantry Division were killed fighting along the DMZ, nearly 4,000 wounded. It was a terrible place to be. Now it so happens that one of the men that was with me in that day, when he came back to the United States, his wife died. And this is nearly 30 years later, but he looked to remarry and he happened to look on the internet and he saw there was a Vietnamese woman who was advertising for a woman, for a man to marry. And long story short, he responded to her and they communicated back and forth. And he went back to Vietnam to meet her as he came into this house. And it was different than any of the other houses in the village for it was a mansion, a huge mansion. It was a mansion of a North Vietnamese general who had fought in that battle, had led the soldiers in that battle. 30 years later, one of our men married the daughter of that North Vietnamese general who was directing that battle against us. But as he met his father-in-law for the first time, his father-in-law pointed to a huge picture on the wall of his uh, of his house, which had a huge portrait of Ho Chi Minh. He pointed to that picture and he said to my friend, that is my leader. When you were in Vietnam, I shoot you. You shoot at me. Now here, 30 years later, you come back to marry my daughter. How crazy is this? And yes, Vietnam was crazy.
Another story then I have to tell you is when I came back from Vietnam, the first week I got a letter and it said my friend Tex had been killed on Dong Ho Mountain. He was a close friend of mine and I mourned. I thought, Tex, I never even knew your name because we called everybody by a name that was associated with the state or whatever, whatever we wanted to call them. And I mourned for him for 40 years, for 40 years, until one day I went to a reunion and here walking up to me is Tex, alive and well. I said, Tex, what are you doing alive and well? They told me you were killed on Dong Ho Mountain. And he said, that was a different Tex. The communications got mixed up. They were certainly trying to kill me. But I made it back just like you did. I live in Texas. I have five children and 13 grandchildren, and I am alive and very well, thank you. No thanks to Vietnam. Vietnam is, was full of miracles, full of incredible miracles. And while I'm rambling here, as I'm trying to think of all of these stories, and then I want you to just know how, how incredibly difficult a single day was in Vietnam, much less 365 of them in combat. This incident was, we were up on Mudder's Ridge again, and we had been fighting all morning, trying to get a bunker blown up where the enemy was shooting at us. Finally, the captain said, we got, we, we got a new weapon coming. The F-4 was America's newest weapon at that day. It would fly a thousand miles an hour and carry a bombs 1,500 pounds of bombs. And they said, an F-4 is coming in behind us. And I'm looking over the, my shoulder and I see out of the corner of my eye a little dot coming at 200 miles an hour, coming bigger and bigger. And a quarter of a mile behind us, suddenly he hit the afterburners, released his bombs, hit the afterburners and flew straight back up into the air. The thunder of his jets swept over us, but his accurate shooting was perfect. He blew up that bunker and those, our bombs flew within 20 feet of us beside the hill, we could watch them hit. Incredible, the F-4, incredible performance those men made. We could sometimes see them supporting us and read their name on the side of their helmet. So I love the Air Force men, how many times they bailed us out, including not only the C-4 or the F-4, but the C-47. Every aircraft did its work there in Vietnam. Now, I also want to tell you about some of the brave men that I fought with. There was a hundred men in Delta Company and divided into four platoons. And usually we um, patrol in a flower pattern where we would concentrate in the center and each platoon would sweep a certain area around us to try to determine whether there was 
an enemy or not, or whether their forces were building up there. There were good men and they were bad men. I just have to tell you about um, one bad man, and that was a lieutenant who came in from from the special forces. He had been to um, to all the the army academies, to West Point graduate. He had so much on his resume that he was such an important fighter. And when he came into Vietnam, he landed and he's all gun ho And he says, when can we get into combat? When can we get into a firefight? Oh, I hope we have a firefight today. We're looking at this man like he's crazy. The last thing we wanted was to get into a firefight. If we could go a day or a week or the rest of the year without a firefight, it would have been very good for us. But here's this crazy West Point guy who wanted to earn his medals and he was dumb enough to think that he could get through a firefight without being shot, without being wounded. Medals meant so much to him, and in reality, they meant nothing to us. Every one of us got nicked and bruised in Vietnam. Every one of us could have had a Purple Heart, but we scoffed at Purple Hearts in Vietnam. They were for if you really got seriously wounded, an arm blown off or a leg or something serious. The piddly little Purple Hearts were for the John Kerry people where one band-aid could cover three wounds. We scoffed at that. But anyway, returning to this lieutenant, finally we're out uh, in the field and he's just as crazy in the field as he is in the camp. And he's out front of everybody striving to get into battle, it get into combat. And we're, we're very, very concerned about this leader who was imposed upon us. And we complained to the captain several times over the couple days. And uh, then came the day where he was leading us and we're strung out through the jungle and he radioed back and said, said, alert, alert. We just came across some fresh tracks. They're, they're very, very close. Get ready for battle. Well, we all came up to the tracks and we seen that it was our own muddy tracks that we had made an hour before the cat, the lieutenant had led us in a complete circle instead of in the straight line he was supposed to do. He was a walking idiot. We pulled the captain aside and said, um, <clears throat> Sir, the next time we get into a firefight, this lieutenant shouldn't be leading us or around us because you never know where a bullet could go and none of us want him to be leading us into combat. Captain Blunt said he's gone. He was off on the helicopter that day. He said, I don't need any idiot lieutenants around getting our company into war. That comes from our captain, Captain Blunt, who was the bravest captain and I want to tell you a couple stories about him. He did four tours in Vietnam, and he was the last soldier on the last airplane leaving Saigon in 1975 when uh, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the NVA overran Saigon. Four tours in Vietnam, and I'd recognize him anywhere because he had his right ear shot off from where he was charging a bunker and an enemy got 
one shot off before he could kill the enemy. The enemy shot his ear off. But I was with him through much of my tour. I seen him earn the medal, the medal of honor twice. I was a few feet from him when he did it. He's charging this bunker that we can't get the enemy suppressed. He says, cover me. So we're covering him, firing with our M16s. And he grabs four, there was two bunkers there. He grabs four grenades. He's sprinting out ahead of us and he dumps two grenades in the first bunker. They're shooting at him. The bunker blows up. The end of the bunker is dead. And he sprints to the next bunker, dumps three grenades in, bang, and the two bunkers are gone. Our captain eliminated them both by his own incredible bravery. Another battle, I was with him when uh, we're in a, in a um, B-52 bomb crater when the battle started and we um, had our two soldiers ahead of us wounded and killed. Doc Myers, who is our medevac, our med person, was with us and he suddenly came into our foxhole and he said, how's it going here, men? How's it going? Anybody wounded? And we said, uh, yes, there's two wounded guys uh, just ahead of us. Uh, and he said, he said, I'm going to get him. You cover me. So we are blazing away to cover him only he gets 15 feet and he gets shot right through the thigh and he's screaming 15 feet away for us to come and get him about this time captain blunt comes into our b-52 bomb crater and he said he said what's going on what's going on and we said, hey, Doc Miners just got wounded 15 feet ahead of us and we can't get him. Every time we lift our head, they're, they're shooting at us and kicking up dust in front of us. He took one look and he said, you cover me, put every shot round you got downhill for the next 15 seconds, which we did. He jumped out of the B-52 bomb crater went and rescued Doc Myers and drug him back to safety. And he never got wounded. Doc Myers made it back and he was still a doctor. He became a doctor in the United States at, uh, at, at the famous hospital in Baltimore, uh, John Hopkins University. Yes, our captain was an incredibly brave man. After the 5th Infantry Division was withdrawn, he went, he, he loved war, he loved his men, but he was a very effective fighter. He went to fight with the Vietnamese, the Arbans, who were fighting and he counseled them on how to become like the American forces. There he encountered one battle he told me about uh, where, where he had, where he had um, all of his soldiers around him wounded and killed and he was the only one that wasn't wounded. He was incredibly perceptive in battle and he knew how to fight. He was the, the greatest fighting man I have seen. He never became 
a general. In fact, he never became more than a captain because he didn't work out well behind the desk. He got to arguing too much more, too much with the high brass and all of the people on how to actually do fighting from an on the ground perspective and they despised him. He resigned from the army five years later. He was still a captain. But when he came back from Vietnam, he was so distraught, so discouraged of what a poor job our brass had done in Vietnam, what a pathetic job our leaders had done in Vietnam. We had won the war twice and our leaders and our Congress had threw it away twice. He purchased a 27 foot sailboat and sailed around the world. It took him three years, but he sailed around the world by himself. He collected rainwater and uh, collected fish that he made it. He went back to Vietnam, met a Vietnamese girl there who became his wife. Later, he had a, another girl who is still alive today. But he sailed all the way around the world on that 27 foot sailboat by himself. And he preferred to live that way. He said, and he said a truth, most of the men that I counsel in my work as chaplain, I don't find them on Main Street or Fifth Street downtown laying in the gutter. Most of the Vietnamese soldiers, the American soldiers that suffer from PTSD and all kinds of other ailments are very, very functional, very good men who take care of themselves, but they often live alone because they're afraid of themselves, afraid of what they may do if they're in combat for some reason or loud noises scare them tremendously. So many of my soldiers then say, I can't do fireworks, I can't do 4th of July because I'm laying under the car trying to escape. Which reminds me of another, and this is a humorous story, and th th this is one of our men landed in Vietnam in the first part of July, and he got sent out to the perimeter, and the captain of the guard said, you know, if you see a lot of rounds coming at you, you know, come back and tell me, I will send reinforcements. Well, about midnight, the whole sky lit up with all different kinds of rounds and different colors, and they came running back to the captain and said, the gooks got more weapons than we know what to do with. They got all different kinds of colors and they're coming at us with their, their guns. What are we going to do? They're coming. And the captain said, you idiots, it's the 4th of July. That's our men in the next base blowing off fireworks. That's our fireworks. Wait till you get to a real firefight. <clears throat> but um, continuing with my story, then uh, we see um, my son works for Senator Thune in D.C. He's a lawyer there for the last 20 years. And so I get to Washington, D.C. often to the wall and I visit my men, 500 and uh, 14 men inscribed in the wall. And I say to them, men I don't know anymore. This ain't America that you discovered that you defended, uh, that you fought for. We've gone crazy since you went to Vietnam. We are becoming more and more communist every day. 
I hope, I hope we can recover that you didn't die in vain. <coughs> but I said, one day I came to the wall and there was a whole crowd of men listening to the wall manager there talking to them. And as I came up closer, I heard the wall manager say, we don't know whether it's true or not, but we heard there was a unit in Vietnam that shot a tiger. He said, we've never been able to prove it. We don't know whether there is such a unit. I raised up my hand and I said, yes, sir, there is such a unit. It's our unit. We shot that tiger. Here's the picture. A tiger made the mistake of coming too close to a hundred men with guns wanting to kill us. But we killed him first. He was a 500 pound tiger, vicious. We traded him, his dead body to the village for six packs of beer. It was a lot more valuable to us. The meat from the tiger was very, very valuable uh, for uh, the Vietnamese. Which leads me to another tiger story, uh, which is the CIA up in our area had a very foolproof way of gathering information from prisoners of war. They took the one thing that the Vietnamese feared more than death. They feared tigers. Even the NVA feared tigers. But in the process of their missions, they had killed a mama tiger with a little pup a few days old. They took that little pup back to their village, to their hooch, and they raised that pup as a puppy dog. He kept growing bigger and bigger, but he was only around humans and he became very comfortable living around humans. And pretty soon he's seven feet long, a full grown tiger. But they developed this idea, knowing that the Vietnamese prisoners of war that we captured were very afraid of tigers. They developed a technique where when they pinched his behind, and then he would roar with his mouth wide open, a terrible roar on command. And anytime the prisoner didn't want to talk, they said, if you don't talk, we're going to give you something that you don't want. And they blindfolded the prisoner, placed the tiger right in front of him and pinched his behind. And that tiger roared ferociously in that prisoner's face. And usually they fainted, usually they filled their their pants emptying their bowels and they talked, talked without ceasing, told us any secrets that they might know. But now comes the end of the war and they got this full grown tiger who only knows human beings and is very friendly, follows them everywhere in the camp. And they got to figure out how to get rid of that tiger. They can't put him out in the wild. To, he doesn't know anything about the wild. So they contacted uh, with uh, the Sydney Zoo in Australia. And they said, would you like a full grown tiger? And they said, well, yes, yes, we'd love a tiger. So they got a seat on a CIA airplane. They rented a seat for this full grown tiger, brought him to the zoo in Sydney. And they had a few females there. And long story short, he became the father of many little tiger cubs. The CIA always has a way of learning how to do things. Okay, so my, my next story then is, is uh, about our battalion sergeant. His name was also Myers. 
He graduated from doctor school in, in the East from one university. And he said, he said, you know, Ron, he said, I didn't think doctors could get drafted, but I got a draft notice that I had to report to Vietnam. He said, I checked and it was authentic. I had a report to Vietnam. I didn't know doctors could be drafted. He said, I reported to Vietnam and I'm talking with some of the other people there and asking what usually the GIs do. What's the best place to go in Vietnam? He said, and I overheard somebody say Quan Tri. And so when they asked us where we wanted to volunteer in Vietnam, I raised my hand and I said, Quan Tri. He said, by the silence in the room and the shock on everybody's face, I knew that was the wrong answer. But I had said Quan Tri and to Quan Tri they sent me into the middle of the thickest of the battles because of this, this was Kantian, this was Kaysan heating up at this point in time and we fought a ferocious battle in Kaysan. Their officers are doing all the planning for this for the 5th Infantry Division and they're talking like this is going to be a big battle. And he said, I made the mistake of raising my hand and saying, will I be coming along? Very innocently, he said, I knew by the shock in the room and the look on the people's faces, I had asked the wrong question. Of course I was going to go along. I was the battalion surgeon for crying out loud, the general said. So off I went and he wrote a book afterwards and he actually was a birder. He loved to spot birds and that was one of his pastimes in Vietnam. But one of the chapters in the birding book he wrote was a book about the battle at Khe San where he was patching up soldiers out of the battle that he was on the front lines with. Now, while I get back, I told you about uh, the story of that there was 1,000 soldiers killed in the last day. His friend was another doctor who was a birder with him. And on the last day he was in Vietnam, he said, I want to make one more trip out there uh, to, to get a picture of another bird before I go home. He ran into an ambush and he was dead on the last day in Vietnam. Now, my lieutenant was also a very brave man. I was blessed to have two of the bravest officers leading us that any soldier could ask for. We would have followed them anywhere. But he was telling me it's his last three days in Vietnam. Now it's his last two days and sure enough, a mission comes back down that he has to lead a convoy of trucks up to Dong Ha. He said, and I'm, I'm so scared by this time, I'm low crawling just to go to the latrine. He said, and now they send me on this truck convoy that's a sitting target for every Vietnamese NBA to shoot at. He said, and I'm sitting there thinking and thinking what would be the safest truck to be on. I said, I didn't want to be the first truck said, I didn't want to be the last truck. So he said, I thought I'd be the second to the last truck. He said, we're going along. Everything's going pretty good. All of a sudden, he said, the truck in front of me blows up, flies 20 feet through the air, turns upside down and falls on its back. There was a command detonated bomb that the NBA had put into the road looking to get one of the trucks. They happened to get the one, the third one in the end of the line instead of the second to the end of the line where my lieutenant was in. He said, I went home very, very grateful, never went out again.
So Lieutenant Horn came back home. He went to work for a 3M company in Minneapolis, became a high officer there and earned a ton of money. And he earned every cent uh, that he had uh, that he had earned. Um, Rodney Roberts was a friend of mine in Vietnam, and he um, came about three months after I was in, and he was a very overweight guy. And the typical thing was when you came into Vietnam, you got to dump your M60 onto all the new guys who came in. The M60 was the machine gun and involved the heaviest weapon and involved the heaviest material and ammo to carry. So I was carrying the M60 at that time and Rodney never forgave me for dumping the M60 on him as he came into Vietnam. And he carried that and we're going up and down mountains and he's very overweight and you can just see the fat melting off of his body and in no time he was as lean as what we were. But anyway, one day he was at the last of the line and <clears throat> we're marching through the jungle and he said, I can't, I can't go on anymore, I can't go on. And he sat down beside the trail and he said, I'm not going on, I'm, I can't take another step. Sergeant Bonner was our first sergeant. Sergeant Bonner heard this and he came back to him and he said, well, so he said, I can't make you keep on walking, but give me your peaches. He said, and take your last peaches and eat them. The gooks are about 10 minutes behind us and they'll love to see you and I don't want to give them your peaches. Rodney said, boy, he said, that inspired me. He said, I leaped up like I had new strength. He said, and I was at the front of the line in no time. I didn't, couldn't believe the reserve of strength that I had. Which leads me to, to Master Sergeant Bonner, the second bravest man in Vietnam. Sergeant Bonner was much older than us. He must have been 23 or 24. But every time there was a battle going on, every time bullets started flying, all of us were trying to get something between us and the bullets. Not Sergeant Bonner, he's charging up to where the battle is taking place. And I could never believe the bravery of this man. One time he Twice we had a booby trap go off that that wounded nine guys and killed one. And he was in the midst of those nine guys and didn't get wounded. Twice that happened. But a couple of years ago, shortly before he died last year, I said to him, Sergeant Bonner, how many Purple Hearts do you have? And he looked at me and he said, None. He said, no bullet was going to catch me. Incredible, incredible men like that led our army in Vietnam and they, they washed out all of the bad men uh, that were also there. To eat, now we had our sea rations. Lurp meals at that time were still in the experimental stage where you had to mix water with them. To eat, we simply all ate on the trail, putting out guards. 
aid and kept on moving on. But the um, choice meal was to kill something out in the field. There was a water buffalo that we butchered. Cost the U.S. Army a lot of money because they flew in somebody to ask why this villager's water buffalo had disappeared. We had eaten it. I don't know how much money they paid to the villager, but the U.S. Army paid for a lot of water buffalo steaks. But one day we shot a warthog. You know, warthog, you have to realize, is a very mean uh, animal. The tusks out of its, if it attacks you, it's, it's vicious. We shot it as it approached us to attack us. And we thought, well, you know, he's a big hog, you know, we'll roast him over a fire. So we got a roaring fire going. We thought we were going to have roasted pig. But when we cut into him, we found that he was full of cancer and he was, there wasn't one piece of him that was edible. Which leads us to the next animal that we captured, which was a 16 foot bow constrictor. Bow constrictors were dangerous in Vietnam because they would sit up in the trees and they dropped on your victim and would squeeze you to death in no time. Somehow or another, this bow constrictor, we found it without it killing any of us. We killed it and we have the picture of this 16 foot bow constrictor again which we sold to a nearby village for a six pack of beer. <clears throat> but now I'm in another battle and we're assaulting this hill. The company ahead of us, C Company had assaulted this hill and lost I think like 12 killed and so many wounded. Their bodies were still there as we're charging up the hill. We reached the top of the hill. The enemy had an encampment below them. And on the hill next to us, there was, they said, going to be a, a marine air assault in 15 minutes. And my platoon was to go down our hill and up the valley into to join up with the Marines. Well, the Marine air assault comes in and we see men flying out of the helicopters on the hill next to us, establishing their perimeter. And our captain said, go. And so we're single file marching toward, toward to join up with the Marines. Very soon there's a lot of bullets flying around. Very soon there's 50 caliber bullets flying around. The gooks were shooting at us with a 50 caliber because they were trying to come between us who were joining up with the Marines and our company our captain said, get back, get back, get back as fast as you can. We're charging back through little trees that were this big standing between us and 50 caliber bullets. We, it was so hot. I became so hot that I developed a heat stroke. And soon I'm unconscious and got medevaced out. And when I got back, got to the medevac and came to, uh, the, the doctor on duty said, 
He said, you were the hottest individual I ever seen. He said, your temperature was so high, I can't believe you made it. He said, but you're going back to the field tomorrow. I said, I can't take it. I can't take that sun. I can't, can't stand it. He said, sorry, soldier. That's what you got when you signed up. I said, I didn't sign up. I was drafted. He said, same thing. Off you go. The sun from that time on, once you have a sunstroke, it's easier to get a second one. The sun was so incredible. Every time I came across a stream, I just took my helmet out, dumped it over my head and over my uniform to cool down. I carried the most water bottles of anyone in the company because it's a long swim to go back to the United States across the Pacific. And I didn't want to have Sergeant Bonner want my peaches when I couldn't go on any further. Then there was another battle where we were fighting. I had the M79 at this time. The F M79 is a bloop gun. It's got a shell this big and you shoot a single shell and it's a grenade that explodes after it spins seven times, seven feet away. And it's a very effective weapon against the enemy which are near you because it is effectively a grenade. <clears throat> well, in the process of an enemy attacking, my M79, as I'm lifting it up, goes off into the foxhole where I'm at, into the perimeter that I had dug, and there's the shell buried in front of me by accident. All of us exited the foxhole as fast as what we could because this is a grenade. Would have killed all of us there. The captain comes by and he's a very gun-ho captain. And he said, what idiot did this? What idiot shot in his own foxhole? I said, it was an accident, Captain. As I was raising my gun, my trigger finger hit the trigger and it went up. He said, you idiot. He said, you dig that grenade out and throw it away. I said, dig the grenade out? It's armed, Captain. He said, no, it's got to go seven feet before and spin seven times before it's armed. He said, you dig it out and throw it away. So there I am digging it out inch by inch by inch around it as carefully as what I can. I really don't need a grenade going off in my face. But the captain, I knew this captain, if I refused to do it, it was so fierce of a man, so so inconsiderate of a man. This was not Captain Blunt. It's a different captain. They would shoot me if I wouldn't have done it, if I would have disobeyed an order. So I dug that grenade out and threw it seven feet and it did not go off. God was with me again in uh, that digging of that grenade, otherwise I wouldn't be here. He was a wall round about me. R again, fulfilling Psalm 118, verse 17, so incredibly. <clears throat> Now, on the trip over to in Vietnam, there were some soldiers who had re-upped. Sometimes you can do that in Vietnam uh, because you got an early drop. If you had less than five months left in the army, you would get an early drop. And some people who especially weren't in combat re-enlisted for those five months. 
But anyway, these men were on the airplane with us. Here you have a bunch of 18-year-old, 19-year-old boys flying into combat for the first time, landing in this country they had heard all these bad things about. But they were telling war stories now, and they said, when you come into Vietnam, they said, you're going to be coming in, the plane's going to be skidding to a halt, and they'll be handing you your M16 as you get off the ramp. Run as fast as you can for the bunker they point you to. Needless to say, you got a whole plane of 170 new rookie GIs, scared to no end. Certain they're going to get shot within three steps off the airplane. But here we land in Saigon, in Benoit, and we're looking out the window anxiously, and all we see is a lone Vietnamese gardener there mowing the strip on the lawn of the airport. There isn't an enemy within 20 miles of us. But they all got a good laugh out of scaring a bunch of GIs. <clears throat> But then I have to tell you about my friend who was wounded three times when he charged out of his foxhole. The first bullet hit him here, went completely through his chest and came out the other side and traveled on. The second bullet hit him here in the shoulder and stayed there for 16 more years. But the third bullet was more serious was a 50 caliber bullet that took off his leg. He said, I never thought I was going to die. He said, I'm fainting from, from pain. He said, I never thought I was going to die until I woke up. He said, I woke up. I'm on a hospital bus back in the United States with 10 other badly wounded Vietnam veterans. We got tubes and sticking out, needles sticking out of every port part of our body. There were lots of them wounded worse than me. He said, we came to a corner and all of a sudden the bus starts to rock. A bunch of hippies in San Francisco on the way to our hospital, attack our bus and attempted to tip over this bus and kill these 10 badly wounded veterans. He said, I thought I was going to die for the first time back in my own country by my own men who were singing chants to Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh, calling us baby killers and that we deserve to die. He said, that was my welcome home. And you can't know how many Vietnam veterans were spit on on the way home. Another of my friends was badly wounded and he ended up in Japan for the badly wounded. Usually they sent you to Japan with the hope that you can still go back into combat at some future date. But finally, infection set in and they said, they said, you're going back home. He said, I landed in a little town in Texas, my hometown. I'm on crutches, hobbling out of uh, the air airplane. He said, and a woman runs up to me and she said, oh, oh, were you wounded in Vietnam? And he said, yes. She got in his face and she said, I wished you would have died, you baby killer. Vietnam veterans for, sadly, the 40 years after Vietnam, were treated very, very, very badly. We were third-rate people. I make a habit to always meet all of our soldiers at the airport, 
to always thank them for their service. We had won Vietnam for them. We had defeated communism. We had kept them safe. And you'd have thought that we had planned to kill them. They called us baby killers to our face. But guess who were the real baby killers? Them, for in 1973, they initiated the Roe versus Way Supreme Court decision, which killed 62 million little babies. No, Vietnam veterans were not baby killers. We shepherded and guarded babies, even at the cost of our lives. But many, many Americans did not. Then I have to tell you about my best friend, Ruben. Ruben was a Mexican-American soldier from San Antonio. And he was from divorced parents. But he got drafted into the army and he <clears throat> was a good man. But on 9-11, well, I have to backtrack up a little bit. Two weeks earlier than this, I was turned in by my captain to lead 4th platoon. And they said, well, we got to wait for orders to come through and you'll take over the leadership. It was an E5 position. It was more pay. And I was looking forward to this. But when the orders came down, my captain said, I never seen anything this funny before. He said, I put your name in and Ruben's name came back. He's going to be the leader. I was angry about that. I said, what kind of mix-up is that? The captain said, I never seen a mix-up like this before, but I can't change it. Reuben's going to lead. You'll be the next leader after him. Well, two weeks later on Hill 162 again, I'm in my foxhole and Reuben walks by me and I can still see his face to this day. He walks by me, he has some, about a minute to live because the NBA had put an ambush up against our perimeter and he was machine gunned to death. But I marveled at God's providence in this I was supposed to walk where Reuben was walking. The orders had gone in, but God had changed the orders so that Reuben walked where I walked that day. God was the great substitute for me. And I use that again in my sermons as, as chaplain, when I point to Jesus Christ as the great substitute that his blood cleanses from all righteousness that he is the substitute for sinful man and i point to in such a simple way earthly way reuben stood where i was to stand just like jesus christ stands where i was to stand in the last day and he redeems me. What an amazing story, but it's a continuation of Proverbs 118 verse 17, that God would be as a wall round about me in miraculous ways through thick and thin in ways that I could not have begun to even imagine. Now we are at Kantian. Kantian is the northernmost base in Vietnam. It's a mile from the DMZ. 
Conti and shortly before we were there had the most GIs killed of any other base anywhere in Vietnam. Every day they were subject to 1,700 rockets in this one half mile square area. And so many uh, veterans were killed there, primarily Marines at this time, because it was in 1967 and in 1968 when we replaced the Marines. Something amazing had happened, and this was that, that Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, who had designed this whole Vietnam War according to his brainiac plan uh, that he was going to use machines uh, to do the fighting instead of soldiers to do the fighting. And I had read about the McNamara plan for many years before this uh, that would change the way of warfare uh, that Soldiers would just sit in their bunker and push this button and push that button and as the sol enemy was coming over uh, the hill, you would waste them just by pushing buttons. And so I said when I got to Vietnam, where's the McNamara line? Where's that bunker? I got my pushing finger all ready to destroy the enemy. And again, they laughed me to scorn. They said, Private, you need to shoot him yourself. Don't believe Robert McNamara's dream. But it had done one thing. And if you looked at Contian, and there was a one mile smooth space out of, of Contian, it was called the Trace. It was made there by. McNamara's bulldozers and he bulldozed an area for one mile before so many uh, enemy rockets interrupted his work that he had to quit the McNamara line and give up on his stupid, stupid dream. But one thing that it did do and that was it diverted uh, the artillery away from the DMZ and around the DMZ, down Laos and uh, the Cambodian Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was again a fortunate thing for me, again God's plan, that there were less rockets landing where we were, less enemy contact, less enemy soldiers. Again, just a providence of God. But Robert McNamara, if you remember, created the ETSO. He was at Ford Motor and the chief engineer of the ETSO, which lasted for two years as a car, and then they discarded it as a useless car. Well, his plans for the McNamara War were just as useless. You don't, you don't push button warfare. You don't plan warfare on computers. They did a time test of the Vietnam plan, of McNamara's plan, and what his outcomes were supposed to be. And he said, the computer said, they asked a question to the computer, when will we win the war? This was in 1968. And the computer said, what do you mean? You won it in 1963 already, according to all of our data. The data didn't mean nothing when it came to hand-to-hand -hand fighting. <clears throat> but now we're on... Well, well, let me say one more thing about McNamara. I already told you about the B-52s. <clears throat> the Russian spy, Walker, the Navy spy, the Walker family told, and, and they were able to discern where the B-52s were to land up to two hours ahead of time. 
But now the B-52s are going across the Ho Chi Minh Trail and especially trying to get the soldiers who are pushing bicycles and many times just a soldier is walking down the Ho Chi Minh Trail with one shell, deposits it in South Vietnam and goes back for another shell. But they had to divert the McNamara plan who said, well, they're on this trail and you just have to bomb this trail. Well, they used detectors called urine detectors, which would supposedly detect the urine of a bunch of soldiers walking down the trail. Only thing was is the NVA came with an innovative trick to defeat that. Uh, they got gowns and gowns and gowns of urine from animals and other soldiers from much further away and dumped them in the place where they were supposed to, not supposed to walk, but we dumped B-52s and artillery all on uh, the the scented trail and managed to miss everybody. The Viet Cong and the NVA had many, many tricks to, to divert our forces. And one of the things that we didn't know was that they were always underground. And so if an enemy soldier was moving, they were moving to, from one bunker to the next bunker, many times 30 feet underneath of the ground. There they would be eating regular prepared food and waiting until our artillery ceased, until our bombs ceased. Then, then they would come up out of their bombs craters, out of their caves to fight us all of our bombs, all of our artillery, which we had used to, used to soften up the target, had done nil to them, nothing to them. We couldn't figure out why we met all of these soldiers ready to fight when we had just dumped all of these tons of bombs on them. Then they had a second tactic, which was just as effective and that was when they exited a battle, then they exited it as close to us as what they could, going backwards from where the battle had started, that they walked only a few feet from us as quietly as possible through the jungle, knowing that the focus of our uh, bullets was going to be the front lines where where we had originally been fighting. They left one man back with a machine gun to keep us active while the main force walked past us. And I seen that happen in, in action and I didn't know it, but intuitively it saved my life one day as we're charging up this hill for this machine gun fire that's coming from this bunker that we'd been fighting against all morning. And <clears throat> I'm on the end of the sweep going up the hill next to the jungle. And all of a sudden I heard someone curse in Vietnamese as he stumbled over something. I was to the extreme left. There was no one to the left of me except them. If I would have swung my gun to where they were, and I, I would not be here today. Intuitively, God focused my attention instead of where the enemy really was on the foxhole where we managed to kill the last gook. But then I have to tell you also about helicopters. I told you about helicopters already. We had 12,000 of them in Vietnam. Not very many of them didn't have bullet holes in them. 
and most of the ones that didn't were the ones which were flying the general because every time there was a major battle, the generals didn't let the captains fight it intuitively on the ground knowing what the terrain was, but every general thought he was John Wayne up in his helicopter 2,000 feet up. And so in this particular battle where we had then, we heard about the general had received awards for that battle for his bravery under artillery fire. He was 2,000 feet up in the air. The closest artillery to him was 2,000 feet below, but he got a medal for dodging artillery fire. There was no justice in Vietnam and unfortunately, unfortunately, there were many, many, many bad leaders in Vietnam and the higher the rank that you got, the worse the leaders became that were only in it for the medal themselves, for themselves, and they saw the GI soldier as cannon fodder that they could use to implement their will. And one of the worst ones, which will offend many people, but was Dr. Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger developed the plan then for Vietnam after, under Nixon, President Nixon, and he was on record last year. He's still alive. He's 100 years old still alive and he said, he said, I just love the American soldier. He said, I can put a hundred of them here. I can put a hundred of them there. I can put a thousand of them here and I can impose my will. That was his mentality. That was the mentality of so many higher ups. The grunt on the ground was cannon fodder that they could use to impose their will. A tragic, tragic use of men that makes the 58,272 soldiers on the wall a living shame. Shame on our leaders, shame on them. We had the war won twice and you lost it for us. And unfortunately, Except for the Gulf War, you haven't won any wars since. And if I look at Afghanistan and Iraq today and Ukraine and surely to be Israel, we're fighting, our, sol our soldiers are fighting the same way, being imposed into a battlefield by the higher-ups as cannon fodder to impose their will. <clears throat> so next I want to tell you about, uh, about hand grenades, claymores. A hand grenade, you know, was a small pineapple size grenade that you can throw approximately 30 feet when you're within hand grenade distance, you are very, very close to the enemy, but we threw a lot of hand grenades. But the Claymore is a better weapon because it's equal to 10 hand grenades and it's a flat-sided weapon that you carry in the ground. Its front side is all BBs, its back side is all dynamite. And when you blow it outside of your perimeter, uh, then it will kill everything within 30 feet in front of it. But also if you are standing behind it, within 10 feet, it will also kill you. The blast is so incredible. So claymores and grenades, you needed to be very, very careful with them. One night I had blown all of our claymores in front of me. We had enemy attacking us. I had 
shot much of our M16 ammo. We're still collecting gunfire and my M16 jams. The M16 had a bad habit of jamming. I had a jam twice when I really, really, really needed it. And I can tell you there is no more hopeless, more helpless uh, despair than to be in a foxhole with enemy shells coming at you and you're trying to unjam your M16 so you can shoot back. Terrible days, terrible times. Um, now, I said already where when we set up perimeter, there would usually be a hundred men. We'd have claymores around us and uh, there would be pre-targeting where the artillery would, would pre-target sites so that they could get the ammunition. Artillery strikes in faster because no matter what, you still had to go through uh, the Arbans for permission. The Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese command in order to to shoot one shell but we had what was called the mad minute one of the craziest ideas that ever existed in vietnam for the enemy was always looking where our guns were situated and especially where our m6 our m60s were situated the mad minute was an idea that once you were set up to clear the field in front of you, uh, that uh, you would blow it full of holes. Well, the enemy loved mad minutes because they got a chance to identify exactly where the machine guns were, exactly where the strongest forces were for when they attacked later that night. Not only did it use up a lot of ammo, but it used up so much of our, our ability to fight effectively by surprising the enemy. Every night we had, when we were camped, we had to put out perimeter guards. And that would mean four or five soldiers who are at least 500 feet a lot of times a thousand feet away from our perimeter to be tripwires. We were the expendable force in case an enemy attacked us that night. They would tripwire us in the outer perimeter. The theory was if they attacked, then we could egress back into the main perimeter. In reality, it didn't work very well at all. I've told you many stories about Vietnam, a great amount of uh, detail. I want you to get a feeling of the flavor and uh, the reality of Vietnam. But I have to tell you and emphasize again what the reason I'm here today. And Ruben, my friend, is in a cold, cold grave in uh, San Antonio. I may be blessed and uh, may have four children and 11 grandchildren and God has made a difference where there is no difference because of Psalm 118 verse 17 where the Lord promised thou shalt not die but live and declare the works of God and he was faithful uh, through the last 54 years of my life, not just in Vietnam, but through all of those years, he has led me on the way and he may, I may hear his voice when I turn to the left or to the right. This is the way, walk ye in it. And I may walk by the grace of God. But now I have to also tell you that in Vietnam, there was not a brave 19-year-old boy who did Rambo and John Wayne things that you may have thought 
I was a very, very scared 19-year-old boy who was protected by an almighty God. Nothing I have said is designed to give any credit to me. God, to the glory of God, everything I do and say, I can't emphasize this enough. Now, when I came home, I told my father about Psalm 118, verse 17, and I can never forget the shock on his face. He leaped out of his chair in surprise and he said, he said, what? What? The Lord gave you that text out of Psalm 118, verse 17, thou shalt not die, but live and declare the works of God. I said, yes, and he stood before me every day as a wall of fire. My dad said, the Lord gave me the same text. He said, and that's before you left. He said, and that was the only reason I could let you go is I knew that the Lord was going to also bring you home. Amazing scripture, amazing text. Amazing God we have. Obedience to him is pleasure. Now we have to also thank all of the Vietnam veterans. I think over 9 million v uh, Americans went to Vietnam at some point or another during our 12 year tour. All of them gave some, some of them gave more, some of them gave much, but the valorant, they gave all, and especially to uh, the KIA families, all of those 58,272 veterans families that are missing one member of their family uh, that had to hear the army announce from that green car arriving on their yard. We regret to inform you that your son has died in Vietnam and also eight women have been killed in Vietnam. Yes, those missing families. We pray that the Lord may fill that empty place with his presence, uh, that you may experience the gift of God himself to comfort you and to give a hope for uh, the unknown future. Once I was putting one of my buddies on a medevac and he was shot full of so many holes. His name uh, was, was Steve from Minnesota. And he's murmuring over and over to himself, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Um, we put him on the helicopter, a medevac flew in, the battle was still raging, bullets were flying around, and we put him on the helicopter that landed in, and as soon as it, it landed and we threw Steve onto the floor of the helicopter, it took off, almost took me with them. I'm running back to our to our perimeter and an NVA bullet strikes one of the pilots and the pilot turns on its side, the helicopter turns on its side before the co-pilot can recover it and Steve's body fell out 30 feet from the ground and if he wasn't dead by then, he was certainly killed in that. 
But I finally found the family 45 years later in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I told them that story of Steve's last words and how he had died. And it was almost too much for that family, and I can understand why. They said they didn't want to hear any more. So I'm very careful to address families who are missing a member. The trauma, I can't begin to feel it. No one on earth can begin to feel it, but you have felt it. And I plead with the Lord to bless you and keep you and guide you for the unknown future. But also to those nine million who were there who didn't give their lives, the 300,000 who were wounded and gave so much of their lives in disabilities and handicaps, to you, you have given much. No one can tell you how much we appreciate you. But to the other soldiers who were there and were subject to all of the dangers of a battlefield, you also gave much. You also deserve honor, not what America gave you when you came back, spitting on your uniform, but also to the Vietnamese people. We were your enemy back then <clears throat> because our leaders told you to fight you. You fought because your corrupt leaders told you to fight us. You had hopes and dreams for the future, just like what we did. We had 58,272 families affected. You had over 300,000 deaths. And if you include Cambodia, uh, then it can be as many as 3 million soldiers that were wounded or died in that awful war of Vietnam. And so to you, I also tell you we love you. We are human beings just like you. We had to fight because that was our duty as a soldier. You had to fight. That was your duty as a soldier. But God didn't make wars. God made us to live peacefully in, in the Garden of Eden. There was no wars. There was perfect peace. Adam and Eve could live in perfect harmony with each other. War came when we declared war on God. Evil came in, sin came in at that door, and that door is the door through which all wars have come in, through which all wars exist, even to this hour. War is terrible, but God is not to blame. Sin is to blame. We are to blame for following after sin. God has no desire in the death of one person, not one person, but sin demands its total. Sin demands its uh, quota. The grave is never full. I beg you never to blame God. Blame sin. And so there we will end uh, this interview.